I'm really fascinated by the way black people show up in majority white spaces. And I'm particularly interested in the way that black conservatives show up in the Republican Party. There are many ways to describe Tim Scott's role in the GOP, but in this video, I'd like to compare him to a common trope in American media, the magical Negro. Come on! You the potatoes, huh? Yeah. Strike that ball, Junior. Don't hold nothing back. Give it everything. You is kind. You is smart. Now's the time. Remember your swing. You is important. I'm sorry for what I am. I think it's easy to misunderstand what I'm saying here. I am not calling Tim Scott a slur, so let's define some terms. The Magical Negro is a recurring character type in American media. This black character's sole purpose in a movie or television show is to help the white characters in a given story, but with a slight twist. The Magical Negro often possesses a special knowledge or some mystical ability that help the main white characters accomplish their goal on the hero's journey. Well, yeah. right back to where you always been and then stand there. Still, real still, and remember. Movies like The Legend of Bagger Vance starring Will Smith or The Defiant Ones starring Sidney Poitier are prime examples of films that employ this super duper magical Negro. Time's gonna come, Joe. The time's gonna come. But if you want it to be right here, right now, that's okay with me. This character will do almost anything, including sacrificing themselves to save their white protagonist. In the film, The Defiant Ones, Sidney Portier's character has a once in a lifetime opportunity to complete his escape from incarceration, to be free. Instead, he does this. He strains to help a white man who has been racist and his sworn enemy throughout the entire film. ultimately falling off of the train, embracing his enemy, and being found by the prison's searching bloodhounds. When this film came out, black audiences were shocked, appalled that he would do such a thing. In many ways, the magical Negro is one of the most offensive tropes in American media because it is so flat. It is a character derived from a one dimensional view of who and what black people are and can be but only in service to whiteness. Perhaps the best and clearest example of the magical Negro trope is found in the film, The Green Mile. John Coffey, Low boss. Without recapping the entire movie, The Green Mile is a film set in 1935 about the lives of death row inmates and the prison guards who oversee them until their execution. Tom Hanks plays the compassionate prison guard and executioner with a painful bladder infection while Michael Clark Duncan plays John Coffey, a simple-minded, gentle giant black man with magical abilities. At one point in the film, John Coffey uses his magical abilities to heal Tom Hanks of his bladder infection by transferring the pain and disease into his own body. He's even temporarily taken out of his prison cell to go heal the warden's wife who has a terminal brain tumor. Once again, ingesting the disease into his own body in humble service to the interests of these white people. In the movie, John Coffey is on death row because he's been wrongly convicted of killing two young white girls. And by the end of the film, basically everyone knows he's innocent. He's even gone so far to use his magic to show Tom Hanks, the person who will oversee his execution, who the real killer was. But even after healing multiple people and a very, very cute mouse, they still decide to kill John Coffey. The real kicker for me is that the film ends 60 years in the future. And by this point, Tom Hanks's character is 108 years old, still alive because of all of the magical abilities of the magical Negro whose execution he participated in. If the viewer isn't careful, one might uncritically accept that John Coffey played his role and served his purpose as the kind-hearted man that he is for the greater good. But I think this gentleness and kindness is a distraction. The magician takes 
the ordinary something that makes it into something extraordinary. Like most magic tricks, the real sorcery of the magical Negro trope is the sleight of hand it uses on the viewer. It says, over here, look at me, distracting the viewer from the larger, more important details happening just out of view. Now you're looking for the secret, but you won't find it because of course, you're not really looking. Yes, John Coffey is kind, but he's also on death row for a crime that everyone knows he didn't commit and he's serving the people who will oversee his literal demise. And in this way, I'd argue that Tim Scott plays a similar role within the Republican Party. For example, in his RNC speech from 2020, and again in his presidential announcement speech in 2023, Senator Scott repeatedly assures his supporters that America is not a racist country. In both speeches, he goes on to point to his own personal success, born into poverty, raised by a single mother. My mom worked 16 hours a day to keep food on the table and a roof over our heads. Yet here he is, an American success story. And, and, and while his personal achievements are certainly worthy of celebration, this misdirection intentionally clouds the point that millions of black people have been trying to make for generations, which is that American systems, agencies, and businesses reliably contribute to negative racist outcomes for black people. These are statistical facts and the exploitation of black people specifically and poor people broadly is built into the incentives of this country. More on that later. It shouldn't be hard for us to admit that America has room for improvement in this area. Our economy was in fact built on exploited labor. American systems aren't fair for black people in nearly every measurable way one can imagine. But to play the role of the magical Negro, one must not disrupt the status quo of the white protagonists. Even when that status quo means the destruction of oneself or the communities that he claims to be helping. In 2017, Senator Scott spearheaded a corporate tax break called Opportunity Zones. Opportunity Zones. My signature legislation, the Opportunity Zones. The headline for this program is that corporations would be incentivized to invest in low-income, presumably black communities to help create jobs and grow the economy in areas most investors would overlook. This initiative that the president and I worked together on is now bringing more than $75 billion of private sector investment into distressed communities. A New York Times investigation, however, found that this program did little to help people in the communities it was advertised to serve. For starters, the program's Opportunity Zone maps often included explicitly low-income areas and the communities right next to them. This means, according to the Times, that the program consistently funneled tax breaks to investment in already affluent or gentrifying areas and or sped up gentrification in the economically depressed communities that needed the most help. Senator Scott still talks about Opportunity Zones as a win for the black community. That's brought billions of dollars back in the poorest communities that have been left behind. But the data says otherwise. The data shows that billionaires and corporate corporations won, while low-income communities were robbed of the resources that tax dollars often fund. So corporate greed is thriving, all under the guise of a positive class and race conscious initiative. This is a classic misdirection. Again, the role of the magical Negro is to help the white protagonist meet their goals, all while making sure that that protagonist's comfort and sense of nobility is undisturbed. In some ways, this character's presence alone is the misdirection. The magical Negro acts as a shield for the white protagonist, no matter how undeserving that character may be. I find it interesting that John Coffey must ingest the disease of the white person in order to free them from it. There is something sinister about this image that haunts. The idea that this awful thing must enter John Coffey, that he must become one with it, embrace something that could kill him for the sole purpose of saving the white people is messed up. <laughs> In 2017, three years before Tim Scott's RNC speech, white nationalists took to Charlottesville, Virginia for the violent Unite the Right rally, which resulted in dozens injured and one woman, Heather Heyer, killed. Politicians across the political spectrum roundly and clearly condemned the group's actions. That is except for one, Donald Trump. But you also had people 
that were very fine people on both sides. You had people in that group that were there to protest the taking down of, to them, a very, very important statue. As I'm sure you're aware by now, Tim Scott is the only black senator in the Republican caucus. So he's like the default DEI guy. So after Trump's good people on both sides remarks, reporters were quick to ask him what he thought of the president's comments. And you may be surprised to learn that Tim Scott spoke in no uncertain terms about the president's statement. I'm not going to defend the indefensible. His comments on Monday were strong. His comments on Tuesday started erasing the comments that were strong. What we want to see from our president is clarity and moral authority, and that moral authority is compromised when Tuesday happens. What we've seen is that moral authority being compromised by the lack of clarity, by what we have seen as the, the pivot backwards, which is very unsettling for many Americans to include me. He all but called the president weak for playing nice with white supremacists. And he didn't just stop there. He spoke with unbridled clarity that racism was a real issue in America. We may have some challenges without any question. Racism is real, it is alive, it is here. Looking back, this almost feels like a totally different person because clearly something has changed. This Tim Scott is disruptive. This, this Tim Scott is challenging the status quo. In 2021, the tension of the 2020 presidential election boiled over into something unimaginable. Supporters of then president Donald Trump believed his lie that the election had been stolen. They stormed the Capitol to stop the certification of Joe Biden's victory. And again, politicians across the political spectrum roundly and clearly condemned the group's actions, laying the blame at Donald Trump's feet for spreading such a dangerous lie. Tim Scott was there that day. I was in the chamber when the rioters were coming over. I was taking my jacket off, my tie off, rolling my sleeves up just in case I had to fight. But when he was asked about the role that the president played in stoking the delusion of these insurrectionists, his tone was nothing like before. Well, John, the president's simply not guilty, so that's why I am in the position that I'm in. But and ever since then, his tone has been different from what we saw in 2017. Victimhood or victory? Victory! Grievance or greatness? Perhaps this is a function of political expediency. Say the thing that voters want to hear. Less CRT yeah. and more ABCs. Yeah. Perhaps instead it's a truly heartfelt change. We need to stop canceling our founding fathers and start celebrating them for the geniuses that they were. I'm really not here to judge Tim Scott for what he believes. People have differing beliefs on different issues. That's fine. I am, however, here to examine and critique the fruit of his actions and ask the critical questions of who do these actions serve and whose ends do they enable? Okay, I think that's a good place to wrap this one up. Of course, as always, let me know what you think in the, in the comments. What, what do you think about Tim Scott? What do you think about the magical Negro trope in American media? Uh, I'm really curious to see how his presidential run plays out. And I'll be hanging out down in the comments to see what you have to say as well. If you haven't already, be sure to like this video. If you made it this far, just go ahead and subscribe. As always, I'm extremely grateful that you're here, my friends. Peace.